Hola amigos, que tal? Stuart here from Spain Speaks with yet another podcast number 14, I believe, in the series. John, number 14? Number 14 Number 14. Yes. Away we go. We're on a roll. 14 <laughs> down. And uh, today we're going to be having a look at some of the uh, questions that people ask. We always get a lot of feedback on the comment section, people curious about um, uh, living in Spain, asking questions about different things. So we'll have a look at some of those things. John, how are you today? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Had a good week? Yep. Uh, some of my uh, allergies have uh, eased back a little bit, so I can actually breathe today. The weather's been... Oh, sorry, we can't talk about the weather. Uh, don't talk about the weather. Don't talk about the weather. Right, five don't talk about the weather. Here. Don't yeah. talk about the weather. Too boring. The weather. Don't talk about that. All right, so we'll talk about something else. We... Uh, we um, get into the day today and of course um the routine john which is the the kids basically right yeah. it's taking them to school and and uh picking them up from school and taking them to sports uh, practice after school and all of the different activities they do so that's the day to day and the work of course so uh always good to get the comments from people so we can talk about different things and get out of our uh, day to day a little bit we got one comment we've got a few comments actually we'll have a look at a few of them but one in particular was asking about uh, dual nationality. Yeah. Uh, ben Carter uh, posed the question, can't you have dual nationality? And um, I saw that you answered, uh, Ben, and you said that no, you can't because Spain doesn't recognize dual nationality with Britain. Yeah, exactly. Um, if you've already got a British passport um, and you come to Spain, you cannot get... Um, a Spanish passport as well. You have to renounce your uh, citizenship uh, from Britain yeah. um, and you actually have to sign a paper renouncing uh, your British nationality yeah. uh, and you, you, they can't actually take your passport um, uh, from what I understand uh, but you have to sign a paper to, to say that you're, you're renouncing your British nationality um, and then of course you're not supposed to use your British passport from there on. Uh, so basically you can't have dual nationality yeah. if you've already got a British yeah. passport. But you, you have been looking into it though, right? Uh, I looked into it. I especially looked into it for my children. Um, so I've got two daughters. Um, we can, I mean, they have they were born in Spain. They're Spanish. Uh, we can get them um, a British passport. They've got a Spanish passport now. They've got Spanish uh, documentation. Uh, we can get them a British passport. They can have both until they're 18. Until they're 18. But it's still not ne- recognized by Spain no. uh, at all. And when they're 18, basically, uh, they're supposed to choose what they want to do, either yep. become a British uh, citizen or a Spanish citizen yep. and give up one of the two. They so. can't They can't have the advantage of having both. No. No. Uh, that's the same for Australia as well. My son does have dual nationality, but as you said, when he turns 18, he will have to decide. Uh, I don't want to go into the to the to the reasons. Uh, I don't want to go into whether he will, um, you know, renounce one or not, or keep both. That's up to him when he turns eighteen. But I mean, there is a lot of advantages to having, you know, uh, dual nationality, yeah. being able to move between countries fairly easily. Yep. British passports always being good for the Commonwealth countries. You can move fairly freely around. Yeah, you know, definitely uh, a lot of African <laughs> countries and. Uh, and uh, half the world, and of course the European Union passport is uh, beneficial as well for yeah, moving around the EU. The Aussie passport, well, it's probably got better over the last few years with a few agreements that uh, the country signed. But for years, it was uh, it was you know you're quite limited to where you could go on an Australian passport. You didn't have the freedom that you had with a British one, for example, being able to work freely in the EU. Probably going to the states a lot easier as well. And as yeah. I said before, those other Commonwealth countries. But I think that has changed over the years. I'm not quite sure. But um, the dual nationality aspect. Now, I think if I wanted to become a dual well, I can't become dual, but if I wanted to become a Spanish citizen, I think the criteria is that you have to be living in Spain for 10 years, a, a permanent resident for 10 years. I'm not sure whether that's the same case for European Union citizens. but I'm not sure if that's the case or not. I know I know a friend of mine's got Spanish nationality. He's just received it recently, and I don't think he applied. I think he pl- applied was before he, he was 10 years. Australian. Oh, he's Australian. Yeah, right? and he uh, he's married to a Spanish girl. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's given up his Australian yeah. citizenship. He's got his nas- uh, Spanish nationality now, yeah. Okay, so he's changing his name as well? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so he's not going to be good. What's his name? 
Well, I don't want to say it on the. Well, okay, uh, but, well, video. Let, let, I don't know if he really wants uh, well, everyone to know. But. Well, okay, we, we won't we won't mention his name, but <laughs> but let's just say uh, his name was John. He's not going to change his name to Juan. No, 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 no. Okay, no. all right, good. So that, that's something that that's, that's something that <laughs> winds me up big time in Spain. This this habit they've got of translating names. I don't understand that at all. I mean, if you've got a name, your name's your name. It's. That, that does it's do, not translate. Do people call you Juan? No. no. Well, you get people joking around. And, yeah, eh, Juanito. Yeah, they start oh, okay. calling you. Yeah. I mean, uh, some of my friends used to call me Juanito Guada Bosques. They translated my whole name. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Uh, which yeah. was quite funny. Yeah. But uh, no, but they. Uh, it took me four years to realise when people were actually talking about the the princes, well, the royal family and stuff yeah. in England, because they so, translate the names. So th- this friend of yours has given up his Australian citizenship. Yeah. Uh, because of job, I, I mean, I, we won't mention his name, but well, job he works, reasons. Or he, well, he works here. He wants to become a civil servant, or no? I think it's just the fact he's living here and it makes it life easier. Makes for it him. easier, really? Yeah, it makes it. Like, you know, if, if you're a, if you're not the Sp- Spanish national, you're Australian. Um, you know, there are certain things that obviously you need to jump through hoops to to get sorted, and uh, I would imagine. Uh, there are a few things that uh, uh, become a lot easier if he's got Spanish nationality. And, of course, the freedom of movement within the EU as well. Oh, yeah, being able to work anywhere, yeah. I suppose. That's the, that's the key. Yeah. So he's, uh, he's, um, he's actually gone the full hole. So when he goes back to Australia, if he ever does, yeah. he has to travel back on a Spanish passport. Again, I don't know whether he's kept his Spanish oh, his, uh, okay. Australian right. okay. passport. We, I don't know. We don't want to open a can of worms. <laughs> exactly, oh, yeah. Okay, okay. So. All right, we don't want to open a can of worms <laughs> and potentially uh, cause problems. But, uh, yeah, that is the case. So the question is whether people do renounce their um, original passport or not because the Australian government is always going to recognise somebody as an Australian. Yeah. Uh, whether or not they've renounced or signed that piece of paper because the Australian government, I don't think, recognises that. So no, yeah, it's, I, only, it's only Spain that Yeah, in fact, I, I mean, someone told me, I mean, I don't know how true this is, but someone told me that uh, the same applies with the British uh, government. Oh, does if it? You can't actually renounce your citizenship. If yeah. you're born in Britain, you're British, end of story. Well, that's it. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you can renounce whatever you want on paper, but, mm-hmm. that you know, you're still entitled to a British passport and everything else. Yeah, well, I presume that works the same way, but maybe there's some legal problems if you get into trouble overseas and you know the if you're traveling to in thailand or somewhere and mm. you get into some legal problem who's who's going to take responsibility for you you know yeah. is it going to be the australian government is it going to be the spanish government in that case i don't know that's that's probably where it gets a little bit yeah. uh, hazy let's say but uh, it is the case so my son um will have to decide when he's 18 he can make the decision uh, to whatever suits him, or you know, maybe he decides to keep both, as uh, I'm sure some people do, and um, you know, enjoy the best of both worlds. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of people do do that, um, but you have got to be careful. You don't use your British passport, for example, to come back into Spain uh, on your way back. You know, you mm. use your uh, Spanish passport, I suppose. Uh, yeah. Again, I think it's if anyone wants to do this, they really need to look into it and make sure they're not uh, breaking any laws or anything. Yeah, w- we had a problem one year coming back from Australia. My son's uh, passport had expired, and I think his uh, identity card had also expired as well. And uh, the policeman asked us, he said, uh, is the boy Spanish? And we said, uh, well, he's got both. And he said, well, he can't come into the country on an Australian passport and stay for longer than three months. <laughs> so that was a bit of a dilemma, but we managed to sort it out at the airport. And we, uh, we <laughs> it wasn't as bad as, uh, as it seemed. But uh, we managed to sort that out, and as soon as we got through customs, with the you know, then like l- literally the next week, we made the appointment yeah. to to update his his um, ID card and all that type of stuff. But you can't have those problems because you yeah. know the the policeman at the uh, airport, the national policeman, saw my girlfriend was you know one hundred percent Spanish, saw me, and you know obviously put two and two together and realised that the kid was probably. Um, a dual citizen and that's that's some of the problems that you can get into but but it is an interesting topic but um to answer the question here no we can't have dual nationality uh i i haven't really looked into it in any great detail but i saw that one of the requirements as i said before was that i i, I have to be living here for 10 years continuously 
then I get the opportunity to apply for Spanish citizenship, and it's a process which can take up to two years, I do believe. Yeah, that's right. But I'm sure that your friend that's recently gone through the process can explain it's it better a than me. bit longer. I better think. than me. Yeah. And I think you, I don't know whether you have to pass a language test like you do in some other countries, uh, but I think there is some type of aspect. There is some sort of test that you had to do. To, to, uh, have to, to prove that you know something about yeah. the country, I suppose, you know. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you have to know who won Eurovision in 1968 or something like that. I'm not quite sure, but you have to you have to have a basic knowledge of the country. Couldn't tell you who won Eurovision last year, let alone <laughs> 1960 something. Uh, yeah, well, I'm not sure whether it was Julio Iglesias or somebody, but it's, it's, uh, something along those lines. But uh, yeah, and the question is whether you do. I mean, I've never felt that I've needed to. I mean, obviously, I, I've I've, yeah. I, I've thought about it and. Um, you know, do I want to become a Spanish citizen? What's the advantage for me? I've thought about that European Union aspect, you know, that you're able yeah. to go and work in another country fairly easily. But as it stands, I looked into this, that if you are residing in a European Union country for 10 years, you can go and get, you can work in another European country uh, more or less automatically as well. All right, okay. Um, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I'm fairly sure that does exist. So, you know, you can have that freedom of movement, but inside the Schengen group, you can move fairly freely anyway. Yeah, you know, yeah it's not too On different. any passport. And the only other inconvenience is that with the... Uh, with my... Um, uh, what's it called? The uh, foreigner's card? Oh, the uh, National Identity yeah. of Extranjeros. I have to renew the, it every five years. Okay. But and yours is a bit different to mine. Mine's a knee, near. Yeah, well, my, is my, mine is as well. But, oh, you're, it, but, okay. but you have like a, you have European one which is called a comunitario. Yeah. And mine is just the permission to work and reside in the country. Yeah. But I can get that renewed without any problems every five years as long as I'm in continuous employment. Yeah. I can't just stop working and then, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So in that sense, it's a little bit complicated as well. So but when you retire, what happens? When I retire? Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that you fall into a different bracket when <laughs> ah, you right, retire. Okay. <laughs> you, you get like work a, until you're 90. You get yeah. like a, you get a pension as a residency. Yeah. So I'm not sure what it is. Well, but I'm guessing I'm going to have to change mine to the same as yours uh, within the next two months. Well, we don't know. Nobody knows. No, no but I've got knows. an idea that's what's going to happen. You uh, think so? Yeah, I think it's going to be as uh, soon as Brexit actually takes fall. Because at the moment you don't have to renew every... No, I don't have to renew. You don't have to renew. Okay. Mine's a permanent resident yeah. uh, card now. It was after to five years so mm -hmm. uh, I haven't actually had to renew for what, 15 years now oh, okay okay <coughs> so. yeah so um, I ha you have to renew it every five years which is not too bad now you can just go down to the local police station you had you before you had to go to a, a police station on the other side of the town stand in a queue for a few hours with uh, hundreds of other people that were going through the same process a lot of South American people for example yeah. are trying to get that they don't have a problem to get dual nationality a lot of the times people coming from uh, South American yeah. countries have a lot uh, have it a lot easier they than have people. bilateral agreements don't they obviously the, yeah because the of the history mm. and all of those things so somebody from Venezuela for example can come here fairly easily and uh, you know apply for uh, Spanish citizenship and get it and also because of the family normally there's one re they're one relative removed from, yeah. from from Spain which is the same for a lot of Australians you know there's only one or they're only one relative removed from Britain or Ireland you know yeah, what I mean exactly yeah. so it's easy for a lot of people to get a British passport as well but it's not going to come in any, not going to come in handy anymore. Apparently, in two months' time, so, <laughs> yeah. so we'll be stuck. Uh, we'll be stuck to living in Britain only. All right, good. Now we'll move on to the uh, the next uh, topic. Here was um, talking a little bit about uh, somebody asked about your views on um, Mallorca, yeah, the uh, Balearic Island yeah. in the Mediterranean, which. From a from afar looks to be an absolute paradise, John. Is it? It's it's fantastic. I love the island. Uh, mm. To be honest, I never actually wanted to move from the island. Uh, I went there on holiday a few times when I was a teenager and really enjoyed the the island while I was there. Um, and then I got a job offer from a company in Mallorca to work in a hotel there. And I went there to work for uh, well, it's supposed to be eight months, and basically never went back. Uh, so the the island itself. It's a decent size. It's not too small. It's got a decent size island. Um, the north is very different to the south. You've got some bigger towns, uh, plus Palma, which is a decent sized city. 
Uh, so it's got a bit of everything, you know. Uh, but for me, the north of the island was just amazing. Uh, I lived up the north end, uh, Cala San Vicente, which is between Poenza and Porto Poenza. Absolutely beautiful little, uh, well, village, if you want to call it that, right in between uh, the mountains. Uh, lovely little beaches. There were coves. Um, it was fantastic. I absolutely loved it. Uh, you said before that you're not really a beach guy. No. But that that was it was still fantastic living there even you know yeah i'm, I'm more, more of a country person than i am a beach person um and it was just i say it was just mountains uh countryside everywhere uh, all around where i lived um it was i love being near the sea uh, or on the sea but mm. not necessarily on the beach i'm not bothered about sitting in the sun i'm certainly not a sunbather at all uh so i was a bit different compared to a lot of uh you know the tourists that yeah, were there of course I just enjoyed the the island and the sea. I like the fishing and uh, and just enjoyed the whole thing. It was yeah, just yeah, great yeah. experience. Yeah, well, that's one thing you struggle to do here, I suppose. Fish. Yeah, in Madrid you have to drive to get anywhere decent to fish, and it's I don't like lake fishing. I like river fishing. So and <laughs> river I, fishing or ocean fishing? Oh, ocean fishing. Yeah, oh, I, I, I do love. I mean, the ocean fishing. You go in ocean fishing, you you eat what you catch. That's it. Uh, it's great, but I mean. Mallorca depends on what you want uh, depends on your experience that you're going to have there uh, I wanted peaceful uh, environment I wanted uh, the countryside I wanted to be with the local people as much as possible as well not all tourists because that gets yeah, yeah. a bit frustrating so definitely the north of the island is a fantastic area to go to if you go to the south of the island uh, you've got lots of pockets of all British people, all German people. There's actually more Germans, I believe, uh, still in uh, Mallorca than there are British uh, that live there. Germans? Yeah, a lot of Germans in okay. Mallorca. It's very popular well, with Germany. Yeah, yeah. I um, I was in Frankfurt a few years ago and um, sitting at the airport for a couple of hours coming back from Australia and uh, literally every second announcement was uh, flight to Mallorca, flight to Mallorca, yeah. leaving. And it was just incredible, the amount of flights. It yeah, was amazing. Loads. I mean, Palmer Airport is absolutely huge. Yeah, it's yeah, one of the, biggest, one of the biggest in Spain. Yeah, I think it's actually one of uh, the most, I don't know about the size of it, but it's one of the most used airports um, uh, tourist-wise across the whole of yeah. uh, Europe, yeah, I think. It's, yeah. it's just ridiculous the amount of touristic flights that are going in and out of uh, Mallorca. But um, it's... Very popular with the uh, the British, obviously. Uh, very, very popular with the Germans. But you've also had an influx of uh, Russian tourists there over the last sort of ten years as yeah. well. Uh, still get quite a few French people uh, travel to Mallorca and that as well. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very popular. And uh, from a work point of view, just mainly tourism and service based. Yeah, there's uh, you, you can get other jobs, but uh, most of the jobs, especially for foreign people, uh, get tied in with tourism. Mm. Um, you've got the, there are some production uh, f uh, factories uh, a lot of leather goods yeah, around yeah. Uh, Mallorca as well like shoes there as well yeah isn't there leather camp, shoes camper, camper yeah. is based well it's Mallorca and I think uh, is it Mallorca okay. um, with regards to the language the language is Mallorca it's like a dialect of uh, Catalan. Catalan I suppose mm -hmm. uh, although you want to say that to a Mallorca person yeah uh, very proud of their heritage very proud of their language yeah um, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there is a um, a bit of a movement on at the moment, or at least that's what we're reading here in the in the national press that that they're, they're trying to um, make a lot of the schools. Uh, what's the what what did you say the language was? Mallorquin. Ma uh, Mallorquin. They're trying to um, to make that the, the the primary language in a lot of schools. They're sort of going down the Catalan. We get the feeling that they're going down the Catalan path. I don't know whether that's true or not because we only get the we only get the yeah. centre point of view here. You know. I've got a lot of friends still living in Mallorca and yeah. they've got kids and schools and stuff, so I can always ask if anyone's interested. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that you might have to keep that in mind, of course. I, I don't know how easy Catalan or Mallorquin um, is to learn. Uh, I mean, if you can if you look, if you speak Spanish already, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's quite it's, it's a weird thing, really, because when I when I was growing up as a teenager, I I enjoyed English. English literature was my, one of my subjects when I did A levels, but. As a language, learning a new language, I struggled. Uh, I really had to put in an effort. Mm. And I ended up, uh, I studied French and German. Uh, I ended up with a, um, uh, well, passing the exams for the German uh, subject, but French I sort of left. Um, when I got to Mallorca, Mallorquin I found completely impossible to, to learn. I just couldn't pick it up at all. Um, 
I started picking up uh, Spanish vocabulary, especially as I started going out with my, uh, what my wife is now, yeah. my then girlfriend. Mm. Um, so I picked up some vocabulary with some friends and things as well. But it wasn't until I got to Madrid I actually learned Spanish. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I think Spanish is probably easier than Mallorquin. Castellano Spanish. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the um, yeah. Well, like I said, that's the that's what I'm hearing. You know, reading the the national press that you know the there's uh, these um, the radical nationalist groups in the Balearic Islands that are trying to impose Mallorquin and uh, well, I don't know. Like I said, I, I can't say if it's true or not, but keep that in mind. I mean, uh, Mallorca does get a bit of a bad rap every now and again from the from a tourist point of view. There's mm. a lot of rowdy tourists there in. It's the, improved. The famous Magaluf. I think we yeah. spoke about that in one of the first. Um, it has improved. I mean, uh, Magaluf was awful uh, years ago. It was really rowdy. A lot of drunks. Um, it was a ridiculously cheap place to go and stay. Mm. Um, so. It, it got a bad rep because it, right. it deserved it but i think over the over the past sort of 15 20 years the the local council have uh, really clamped down yeah, yeah. and it's turned into more of a family area and yeah. a lot less rowdiness and i i remember you said that it was actually cheaper to go from london to <laughs> mallorca than it is to go from madrid to mallorca yeah. so you know it is a, a, it is an, an island that is um really you know, pushing the the tourist. Um, yeah, I mean that's uh, when, I, when I talk about that. It's mainly with if you're actually going to go and stay in a package. Yeah. I mean, if you if you get a flight from here to Mallorca, I'm sure you can pick up some cheap flights. Uh, but then you've got to book your hotel, transport, and everything else. Yeah, yeah. The package deals that you could get, like, especially mainly the last minute ones, uh, if you wanted a last minute holiday, they were selling them really cheap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, of course, the other islands are there uh, Menorca, uh, Ibiza, Ibiza, and uh, Formentera. Formentera. So um, there's. You've got, um, you've got some really nice places to yeah. visit. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, yeah. Mallorca. Uh, he he asked another question here. He says um, he says uh, have you visited many parts of Spain? Um, speaking for myself, I visited. Well, I wouldn't say the whole country, but I've been to probably ninety percent. I've, you've, you've been all yeah, over. I've been all over. I mean, there there are certain cities that I haven't been to yet, which I'd like to go to. Um, uh, Leon, for example, is Leon. one city oh, okay. that I've missed. Uh, but I've been to a lot, uh, most of the major cities, uh, a lot of the smaller cities and the smaller towns as well, mm, mm. Uh, but mainly because of my job. Uh, yeah, yeah, you were travelling around. But yeah. yeah, I've travelled a fair bit with the, with the family as well. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Mm. And uh, it is a, a, a thing when you do live here that, you know, a lot of... Um, uh, not not every weekend, but you know, there's a lot of public holidays where you head yeah. off to a, a different part of the country yep. and you know get some type of uh, rural accommodation and check out mm. the local areas. And living in Madrid, you've got the advantage of you know being in the centre yeah, of the country exactly. of the mainland, so you yeah. can re- re- get to you know virtually anywhere fairly easily. Well, to give you an idea, the the last two weekends, the two previous weekends, I've um, yeah, you've been down the coast. I've been down to the coast. Yeah. Uh, uh, I had meetings. It wasn't uh, touristy. It was meetings for cricket. So last week I went to Valencia. I was yep. there, there and back in the same day. We got the Ave, which is the high speed train. It was fantastic. Uh, an hour and a bit. Uh, hour and three quarters on the high speed train. Uh, really easy, really comfortable, and not overly expensive. It was about hundred euros return, I think, that day. Um, so we've got the train at eight forty in the morning. Got there at half ten. We were there until seven. Got the train back at seven. And we were back here by nine o'clock. There you so go. So it's yeah. uh, dead easy. And the week before that, I drove down to La Manga in Murcia. Yeah, what's that, um, four and a half? That's four four out from where we live in Rivas. It's about four hours if you don't stop. Uh, if you stop, you have a bit of a break and yeah. that. Or if you come from uh, the centre, it's about four and a half. Yeah, because um, uh, from the centre, you you can, you can you know, you've got all the, both the Castillas very accessible. Yep. You've got uh, Aragon is also very accessible mm-hmm. from here as well. The the Levante coast, yeah, uh, definitely. four hours max, yep. I think. Maybe a little bit longer to Alicante, I'm not sure. Um, no, it's about that. About that? Yeah. And the Lucia, you can be in Malaga in, if, well, if you take the train, nothing nowadays. Uh, you can be in Cordoba, Seville, four, four hours, four and a half hours. Yep. Well, Cordoba um, and Seville, I think, uh, both on the Ave as well. So yep. it's about two hours. That's right. Two and a half hours. 
and uh, you can get to uh, the north the north coast. You can get to the Asturias or the uh, Cantabrian coast relatively quickly as well. Yeah, it's not too bad. It's all within sort of four hours, four and a half hours That's most it. of the most of Spain. And I, uh, definitely, without a doubt, for me, my favourite part of Spain is the north. The north Cantabria, Asturias. I love. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And uh, as we mentioned also a few uh, months ago, probably we said uh, Portugal. You can just yep. whip across the border, or France, uh, even. You know, yeah, you I've um, I've driven uh, drove to Portugal in September. Um, that was about five hours, maybe, mm-hmm. to where we were going. Uh, mm-hmm. Five and a half hours where we were going. It's a bit of a longer. Sort yeah, it's of about six. Journey. It's about six hours from here to the coast. Yeah, well, I was a bit further inland, um, and obviously we've been in Rivas, we're the opposite side of yeah, Madrid right. to to Portugal, so you've got to go right around Madrid to get to the road. But uh, but that was it was fairly comfortable. It wasn't too bad. We went there for the weekend uh, as well for cricket, um, and then France. Uh, I've only driven to France once, um, and that was when I was actually driving back to the UK. It's uh, not, but it's not out of the question. No, I mean, I mean, you can no. get you can get to the Basque Country and then you know yeah. go through there. So, I mean, it is something that you um, that you know if you want to escape to another country, yeah. you can do quite easily. I made the mistake of going through the Pyrenees. Oh, you went through Aragon. Yeah, so okay. I was like, yeah, I was uh, going up the mountains. Was uh, in, especially <laughs> in the car that I had full of people and uh and things it? and that luggage it was a bit of a bit of a trek that one not a good experience it was it was fun it was funny but i think we overheat the car overheated like three times trying to go up the up the mountains <laughs> going down was fine it was just going up yeah. uh, so we were by the time we got to toulouse it was we were all exhausted yeah good so you can uh, you can get to these places uh relatively easy uh rel- re- relatively easily let's say um another question here uh, from Stephanie, I think. She says, uh, hi guys, love what you're doing. Planning on moving to Spain next year to finish my grado. Uh, don't know what that is. Maybe some type of degree probably. So I'm concerned about Ocupas. I've read some really bad stories. Do you guys have experience with Ocupas in and around your town? Gracias a ambos. Um, Ocupa. If you're not familiar with the term Ocupa, in English, we use the word squatter. Yes. Somebody that illegally occupies uh, a home, somebody's home or a building, let's say. And um, Spain has had an Akupa problem ever since the housing bubble crashed, and maybe even before that, before I'm not that, sure. I think as well. yeah. Yeah. But it did seem to get out of control when that housing bubble crashed and homes were being repossessed by the banks and families were looking for places to live and... The banks, of course, were not too worried about the properties as a normal owner would be. So, yeah. so uh, I've heard of cases where whole uh, housing estates were occupied. You know, these places that weren't 100% yeah. finished. Maybe the houses were 90% finished, and the bank, uh, you know, they ran out of money or whatever, and they just left them abandoned. And then people, you know, were living in houses, squatting in houses with swimming pools. Yeah, you know, yeah. sometimes you know. They were swimming in the summer and having barbecues on the terrace <laughs> as squatters. Not the image that you have of uh, squatters. But you were saying that the house that you're living in now, before you moved in, there were squatters. Yeah, um, I think it was. Uh, there was. I think when we actually moved in, before we moved in, there was a uh, someone renting their house for, for about six months. Before she was there, they had squatters in there as well. Mm. Uh, they got in through um, uh, through the. Uh, one of the side doors or something and uh, managed to uh, squat there for a good few months before they managed to get them out and it happens quite a lot around uh, I think around Spain in general really but definitely Madrid there's quite a lot of squatters around and if they get thrown out of one place they go and find somewhere else and squat somewhere else yeah yeah take you know the law takes them yeah. quite a while to get them out uh, I don't know whether the situa- I, I don't know whether the situations change now but um, a few years ago, a lot of people weren't willing to rent because of the the possibility that people stopped paying rent and they became squatters. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, yeah. And uh, apparently it was very difficult a few years ago. Maybe it still is. I can't say. Maybe it still is. But it was very difficult a few years to get people out. Uh, I think they've changed the laws a they've little bit now, now? To, mm. to, to facilitate the uh, the removal of people, but I think it can still take a few months and yeah. uh, can still be expensive. 
But to be honest, I mean, most of the squatters, squat, what who you call squatters uh, that just go into abandoned buildings, normally go into abandoned buildings, not someone's home. Because um, I think if you break into someone's home, you're gonna you're no. gonna get thrown out. But well, the, the case wasn't that they were breaking they were breaking in, mm. but that they'd they signed stayed there. Yeah. Well, they 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 signed a a rental agreement, but after two or three months, stopped paying. Yeah, and then trying to get those people out. Because yeah, they do, that's a nightmare. they do officially become a culpas, you know. Yeah. So they've got the keys. They've got, um, <clears throat> you know, they've got, yeah. they've got access to everything. And of course, you can't turn the electric off. You can't turn the no, water off because that's against in, their human rights. Well, it's also probably in their name a lot of the times as well. Yeah, but if it's your house, you can actually. Oh, you can. I, th- I believe you can actually get the water turned off, um, even if it's in someone else's name. Yeah, well, that's pr- probably like you said. You you yeah. start going against people's basic rights. You know? Yeah, and uh, if they've got kids, yeah, you're, oh, it's even worse. yeah, you're yeah, you're gonna have trouble getting them out. But um, yeah, keep that in mind. Um, I did actually give um, class. I had a student a few years ago whose job was to negotiate with with the squatters. Um, he was paid by the banks to sell the um, the abandoned properties to international funds and part of the agreement was that he had to negotiate with these people to get them out because the international funds were willing to pay people money uh, to abandon the property so that they could clean them up, fix them and sell them or whatever. It would be quite a lucrative way of living, couldn't it? Really? Well, that's, yeah, I'm not quite sure <laughs> the, you know, the, the amount of money involved, but... His job was to, you know, to yeah. go to these places, negotiate with the people, try to make them a better offer. Sometimes even offer them another place, mm. uh, but just get them out of the ones that the that these they wanted to sell. Yeah. That, 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 that they wanted to sell, basically. Yeah. That's right. Because at the time when that crisis did hit, and remember the the financial crisis, the real estate crisis here was huge. I mean, there were there were abandoned properties all over the place. The banks had literally. I don't know. I wouldn't want to say hundreds of thousands. I'll say tens of thousands, but I could even say a lot. I could a even lot. say hundreds of thousands mm. of properties on their books. Oh, it was ridiculous. There was so many properties just abandoned, uh, half built. Yeah. Uh, well, even um, public sector buildings as well. The, sun, Look at well, the, that, that's the right. library yeah, well, uh, that, that we've got that, near that, here. Well, that's another reason. And I, was that, well, that that had squatters in yeah, it as well? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, the library actually had squatters, <laughs> but they turned it into a library. Okay. So the squatters okay. actually brought in books. People donated books. They turned it into library because go. it was supposed to be built as a library. Uh, people were very upset by the fact that they stopped building it. They need another library in, in Rivas. I mean, to be honest, I still think with two Reva, uh, uh, libraries in Rivas, there's not enough. Mm. Uh, 80,000 population here now. I mean, come on. Yeah, mm. close to 90, I think. Um, so, you know, these people, they, they took over the building. They actually put shelves up they got books in and everything and they actually created a library for people to go and study in and stuff uh, so I, I don't think it was necessarily a bad thing <laughs> <laughs> but that was uh, that was the case so so uh, and the Spanish government set up a, a special um, like a real estate branch to actually get these uh, properties into private hands. There were there were just there were just so many. You know, to take to take these properties off the banks' hands, the banks that started to have problems as a result, they set up a system called the Sareb, which was like a some type of real estate fund where they would buy the properties off the banks and sell them uh, to to uh, to people, so that the banks you know didn't mm. get into financial troubles by having empty property on their books yeah. as well. So it was a complicated situation, uh, but uh, the problem of a Coopers, I wouldn't be worried about it if I was you, Stephanie. I mean, it can happen anywhere. I remember living in London back in the early 1990s, and there was a squatter problem back then yeah, as well. I mean, it's always, yeah. it's always been a, you know, it's always been around. I mean, there's always that possibility. You can't live um, with the fear that you're going to go on holidays and come back, and somebody's going to have moved yeah. into your home. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. No, it's just, it's just, it's not worth it. I mean. No. And if you and if you're that worried about it, um, you know, if, if you get a place, and put an alarm in, maybe thirty, thirty-five euros a month, and uh, decent quality alarms, and at least that way you've got peace of mind. If if nothing else, um, yeah, I mean, you shouldn't have to worry about it too no. much. And as I say, they tend to, tend to go for the abandoned buildings, not the ones that are being lived in. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's it. So I wouldn't re- necessarily worry about mm. that, uh, Stephanie. If I were you. All right. Good. Now we'll move on to um, what's happening here in Spain at the moment. John, the taxi uh, strike continues. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, we spoke about this a little bit last week. By the time this video comes out, uh, hopefully the strike will be over and everything will be back to normal. The companies Cabify and Uber have decided to abandon Catalonia. Yeah, it's a big step. Big step. So there's a lot of people going to lose their uh, livelihood there. I think it's probably obviously it's a, it's a measure to try to come back to the negotiation table to get rid of the the uh, the, the the stipulations that the council put in place last week. I don't know whether that's going to happen or not. And in Madrid, I don't know what the situation is going to be. But uh, looking here at the paper this week, the uh, Spanish economy grew 2.5% in 2018, which uh, bucked the Eurozone trend. The outlook for 2019 is lower. Now, um, there is a problem trying to get the budget through. People are worried about this. This is the roller coaster that we're on when we live in Spain, I yeah. suppose. The economy grows by 2.5%, but they, the government can't pass the, uh, the budgets. The taxi drivers go on strike and uh, the economy grinds to a halt. Mm. So these are some of the problems that you get. But uh, have you noticed uh, an improvement in the economy uh, slightly? I think it's been improving uh, bit by bit over the last couple of years. Um, People are more willing to part with their cash? Yeah, I think people are going out a little bit more. You see the restaurants a bit busier. Um, The house prices have gone up, that's for sure. Um, Yeah, I think... Yeah, I think I think it's improved a bit. Uh, yeah. You got a few. You still know people that are unemployed; they can't get the work they want and stuff. Yeah, but well, that's yeah. that's the second thing that I was going to mention mm. here is the uh, the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate has dropped fourteen point four five percent. Now, I had a comment from someone uh, on another video that I did that said, um, "Well, I compared Spain and Portugal or something." He said, "Well, in Portugal we've got six point five percent, and Spain is fifteen. 15% is still a uh, it's still a problem. I mean, yeah, there's still a lot of people that haven't been able to find a job. And another article here said Spain ends uh, 2018 with the biggest surge in job creation of the last 12 years. The unemployment rate has also dropped to 14.45%, thanks mostly to the public sector. And the thing was that the public sector um, created 43,400 43, jobs in the final quarter of last year, and the private sector lost nearly 7,000 jobs. Yeah. So 43,400 p- public jobs were created. Now, this is obviously why your mate wants to become a Spanish citizen, so he can, have, <laughs> he can get access to, this, to, these, to these public jobs. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but um, the private sector is still shedding jobs. Yeah. Now, that's a characteristic about Spain. That's one of the things I've never understood about this market here, how many people how desperate a lot of people are just to get a a job working for the council. So many people I know. I mean, so many people I know actually right now are doing the the exams. They study a, they uh, study for years. The opposition, yeah. They study the opposition, which they, that's what they call it. Public so, service entrance examination. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and they study that, and it's it's not easy either. My my uh, my sister in law is doing it now. I've is got she probably yeah? My I've got. So she was in the private sector. Now she's deciding. She's, she's studying for. To but was she there. working before? She's work. She's still working now, but she's studying at the same time. Oh, so yeah, she wants so, a lot of hours. Yeah. So she wants to go into the public yeah. sector. I mean, just it's. I mean, I I don't sort of see these figures um, in probably as a good a light as a lot of other people do from outside of Spain. I think. Um, yeah, the population. Uh, sorry, the population. The unemployment rate has gone down to less than fifteen percent. But how many of those jobs are actually good quality, well, well paid jobs? Well, that's the problem all over the world, though. As well. Yeah, and but yeah, but the moment, I mean, I, just some of the people that have got jobs recently, uh, they they're going into jobs that are still paying maybe nine hundred, a thousand euros a month. I mean, how are they going to live off that? Yeah. yeah, and that's why I think a lot of people want to go into the public sector because they've got a uh, virtually a guaranteed job for life once they get in there. Um, the 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 wages aren't. Uh, especially amazing but they're decent compared to a lot of the private sector jobs uh, around and that's the motivation for your uh sister-in-law to, i think to she get just wants some stability stability yeah, okay stability all right, yeah. and um and she wants to get into a decent job that's uh better paid and she's she's studying very hard to get in there yeah but then i've got probably 
five students that also? are also studying the opposition. Yeah. yeah. But they're for various reasons. One wants to be a policeman, one's, another one's uh, doing it for another teaching job. Uh, I actually teach a, a girl that wants to teach English um, and she's got good English and everything, but she needs to get the opposition to, to yeah. get into a teaching job. Yeah, the I I I remember hearing a few years ago they did a they did a survey of university students and I think it was something like twenty five or thirty percent of students wanted to uh, continue their studies to try to pass these public service administration um, public administration exams to get into the public sector. It is the wish of a lot of people, and as you said, in the case of your sister in law, that's that stability that you can't get a lot of the times in the private sector. Do you know what I mean? And a, a decent salary, yeah, and a job that's guaranteed without the stress. Yeah, you know? exactly. I mean, I think that's why so many people are so keen to to get into the public sector, and you, you can't blame them for wanting to mm-hmm. either. I mean, mm-hmm. but especially with the way jobs are and the economy are at the moment, it's so yeah, up and down. Yeah, yeah. you yeah. don't know what's going to happen. But it is it is surprising that factor because um, you know, as we said here, private jobs, seven thousand private jobs lost, forty three thousand four hundred private uh, public sector jobs created and a lot of people that you speak to you gave the example of uh, family member students of yours um, you know studying for these and it's it's not easy to study for these exams no, they have to spend a lot, a lot of time a lot of memorization yeah. involved as well yeah. then they go to a place I think somebody told me to join the Civil Guard last year there were 30,000 people sitting the exams for yeah. 5,000 places yeah. And that's that's not bad. Uh, the last person I spoke to that went for a uh, police job, I think she was trying to get national police. Or I, think she was, no, I think she was trying to go into the national police, okay. uh, and there was something like forty three thousand people um, applying for these jobs, and there was like one hundred and twenty five positions or something. I mean, this was yeah, a few really years ago yeah. now, but yeah. it was just you know she was telling me. Like, yeah, what are the chances? Yeah, what are the chances of getting in there? Yeah. But she was determined, and yeah. she carried. She, yeah. I don't think she yeah. did it, but right. uh, yeah, that was it. And I, I've come across people that have literally studied for five years, not passed the exam, found themselves at twenty six, twenty seven years of age, yep. and having to try to find a job in the in the private sector yep. when they've literally wasted. Because you, if you don't pass the exam, do you waste? Oh yeah, you don't get five years of your life. You've got to be you've got to be really determined to to get a public sector job because you've you've got to study for uh, yeah. all these years and you've got but to it, make sure you do it. But it is the question that somebody's working in the private sector, and at the same time they're studying to get into the public sector, mm. which creates obviously a lot of stress on the other aspects of their life as well. Yeah. Whereas, uh, I mean, maybe it's just me, but I don't know anybody. I, may, I, I couldn't name a public servant in Australia <laughs> that, no, I, I mean, that I know personally. I only know one or two in England. Uh, my aunt works in the public sector, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of anyone else I know. Oh, well, my, uh, one, of my, one of my cousins used to be a policeman. Uh, but here, yeah, that's it. here I could yeah. go outside, and the people that I know in this particular neighbourhood I, I could find 10 public servants yeah. in, in 100 metres. Yeah, yeah, there's loads. Loads. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. What do you do? Oh, no, I work for the Ayuntamiento de Madrid. Oh, what do you do? I work for the Comunidad de Madrid. Oh, what do you do? I work for Hacienda. Oh, what do you do? I'm a teacher. Okay, teachers, fair enough. Yeah. Okay. But what, there's so many people in, in, in basic administrative positions yeah. inside the civil service, you know? Yeah. It's a lot. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. And they live well. Well, they get, uh, say they get a very stable job. In that's the, uh, it. Once they get paid every month. Uh, they paid every month, and the, the the wages are a decent wage. So. That's it for they Spain, and they don't have to worry about the precariousness of the uh, if that word okay. exists. Precariousness does it exist? Yeah, I think it does. It? <laughs> okay, the precariousness. Another one for lingua. Uh, uh, of um, the private sector, yeah, which uh, people are nervous. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't help but be nervous no. at the moment. It's Everything's up and down. And just when you think things are starting to get better, yeah. then all of a sudden there's a drop. And it's, uh, it's, I think a lot of people are very nervous with, with anything to do in the private sector and, and jobs at the moment. Even people that have got jobs that have had them for 10, 15 years. That's right. They're stable but you, you, they just can't relax because you just don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, it could be a downturn and bang, you're yeah. gone. Yeah, that's it. But anyway, so we'll wrap it up. 40, 
plus minutes again. We'll um, we'll uh, be back again next week, John. Uh, I think I can't see why we wouldn't be. Um, we won't talk about the weather. <laughs> no, that's good. But uh, we'll see what uh, topics pop up to uh, speak about next week. So thanks for your uh, contribution again. No problem at all. And uh, we'll see you all again next week. Don't forget to uh, leave a question or comment in the sections below. Download the podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. Listen to it uh, on the train in the morning, in the car. Whack it on in the car in the morning. And uh, we'll see you in the next uh, podcast. Or you can hear us in the next podcast uh, next week. Hasta luego.